Let, um, <clears throat> let me start you off with an easy question. What the heck is going on in your country? <laughs> Do you, and the last time you interviewed me, it was the day after the Monica Lewinsky story had broken. Um, and the United States had come to a screaming halt. People were just, could speak of nothing else. Nothing was happening. Trains were stopped. Planes were stopped. Everyone was obsessed with Monica. And here I am in Canada, and Michael starts the interview by saying, well, so, having another of your little psychodramas down there, eh? <laughs> <laughs> um, gosh, just the usual, usual amount of fun and frisks and jollifications, what can we tell you? I don't know. I think there we were. It was September 11th. It was a terrible event. The entire world was sympathetic. Everybody was rushing to offer help. Uh, the French even offered money. Um, <laughs> and here we are uh, a few years later, and everybody hates us. And uh, I don't know. Um, I have never. Um, the trouble with American liberals, one trouble with American liberals is that we tend to hear the sound of jackbooted fascism around every corner. Um, but I am kind of worried about the state of the, state of the nation. My boy George W., um, it seems to me, is not contributing to uh, world betterment, to put it mildly. There are two, at least in my, in, in my perception, there are two George W.'s. There's the pre- 9-11 and the post 9-11 and in the days following that awful assault and that murderous attack he seemed to rise to something he seemed to to be able to be very presidential in coming to grips with it now are there two w's here are there two george bushes no i i don't think so um i mean i keep seeing the same one i've known all these years I've known him since high school. I never knew him well, but I've known him for a long time. Um, w, there's no question about it. In the, <clears throat> the speech he made after, after September 11th, the Joint Address to Congress, was the speech of his life. And uh, I think Americans all signed up to you know, support the only president we got. And um, by the time he finished dragging us through that war in Iraq, I think we were back to having doubts about him. And I, you know, in some ways, I think it must, I think how terribly frightened he must have been uh, and to have had that happen on his watch. Uh, you know, it's not, um, foreign policy was not his forte. <laughs> he, he didn't run on, for the president on the grounds that he would be a great international leader. Um, and, you know, we, we had hopes he would be barely adequate. Um, and all of a sudden, I don't know whether you remember this, but during the 2000 campaign, an American journalist uh, asked him one of those gotcha questions. You know, he said, while well, you're running for president, can you name the leaders of the following three countries? And of course he couldn't. Um, and everybody thought, oh, that's so mean. I mean, you know. <laughs> Who would need to know the names of the leaders of foreign countries? <laughs> the countries were North Korea, Pakistan, and India. Now, if they'd ask him the head of Canada. <laughs> what do you think? Do you think you would have been there with the answer? Do you? Oh, no, I think we all would have known it never would have mattered. <laughs> you, have, you have to give us a sense of, of how Texan he is. You describe... Yeah. In your book, you describe uh, Texas as Mississippi with good roads. Right. Um, how, how Texan is George W., and how, on the other side, un-Texan is he? Um, I think he is culturally Texas-identified to an extraordinary degree. Uh, you may recall his daddy is a classic example of sort of Eastern upper-class wasp. Uh, whereas W, oddly enough, who was born in Connecticut and educated back east at very fossey schools, um, is really Texas identified to a striking degree. Um, and Texans realize that and think of him as a Texan. We always had our doubts about Poppy Bush because real Texans do not use the word summer as a verb. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, 
But W really is a Texan. And I think you see, in terms of the personality, you can see three distinct strands of very Texan uh, culture sort of woven together in him. One is the religiosity. Mm -hmm. uh, two is the anti-intellectualism. And three is the machismo, uh, the um, male swagger. And all three are typically Texan, and all three actually strike uh, very responsive chords with a lot of the electorate. Um, and I think it comes in part from Bush's experience. He went to school in the East, to both prep school and college, and he really thought that um, a lot of the people he met back East were snobs. And he identifies snobism and intellectuals uh, as the same thing. He's actually said, you know, these people from the East who come down here and laugh at my friends from Midland, they, they really make me mad. And, you know, he doesn't express himself very well, but you could see he was, he was, he was deeply felt. On the, on the, <laughs> on the religiosity mm -hmm. question, he's quoted uh, David Frum in his book, David Frum, a Canadian, right. actually, quotes him in the book saying that when he's in the Oval Office, I really shouldn't be here. I should be on a bar stool in Dallas, and if it wasn't for God, that's where I'd be. Yeah, he, did, he said that in the 2000 campaign, uh, he, that he went to a rehab house for alcoholics and drug addicts and told them, deeply moved apparently, you know, obviously, that uh, if, it, if, it had, if it were not for the grace of God, I would be one of you. Um, and, you know, people who work with alcoholics, um, believe that there is a, a long process by which you gradually recover from that disease and that it involves work over time. <clears throat> the alternative method, which is just, you know, God speaks to you and there you are, um, apparently leaves some unsolved <laughs> questions of baggage um, that he, he might, I mean, I don't do armchair psychoanalysis because I am totally uh, unqualified, but um, and have no need of it. They're totally normal person. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Curbstone Floyd is not my thing, but um, I think it leaves some unresolved questions. Tell me about his experience and the experience of Texas when he was in the State House. Um, in Austin, because I get from your book and from your columns mm -hmm. that there's been a kind of transmigration of Texas onto the entire United States of America, and by extension, the rest of the world. What kind you of a are governor in was so he? So much trouble. Um, there's a country western song, uh, "Love It on Everything," and uh, I'm starting to think this is like Texas on everything. I mean, he is turning the, the entire country, the rest of the country, into Texas. I don't know why they don't secede. Um, <clears throat> when W came, became governor of Texas, he inherited a very tidy surplus uh, from his predecessor, who had also helpfully solved a number of long-standing problems uh, in this state. And we had resolved the school funding crisis and the prison crisis, uh, construction crisis, and lots of other annoying things. And, he sailed in and um, sort of took credit for all of it. Uh, but you know, there's an old saying in politics, it's better to be lucky than smart. Um, and Bush has been lucky his entire life. So he came in, he took over a gin and economy and, and a balanced uh, a budget in surplus and promptly gave a huge tax cut to the property owners. Um, and then he gave another huge tax cut to the property owners. And then he sort of left for Washington. Uh, unfortunately, um, he left no money in the rainy day fund, which is, you know, it's a sort of savings account you're supposed to build up for bad times. And we had absolutely nothing in it, and uh, the economy turned sour, and the state ran a $10 billion deficit. $10 billion? Yes, this year. Uh, which meant that we had to, since the state has been now, now completely taken over by Republicans, um, who, who do not raise taxes, um, we had to slash $10 billion out of social services in a state where the level of social services is, thank God, for Mississippi. <laughs> there are around the president, and indeed the vice president, 
uh, a number of people who have been variously described as friends, pals, and cronies. Can you talk a bit about this network of, of shadowy people, and, none, and some not so shadowy, that, that are around him and the influence they have on him? Karl Rove, for uh, example. I thought you were talking about Dick Cheney. Um, <laughs> Carl Rove is a campaign consultant. I've watched him operate in Texas for 30 years. He's really, really good. He has no scruples at all. Um, and he just is, he is a really tough player. And he is perfectly capable of running campaigns, I've seen him do it, uh, that are nasty, vicious, and racist. Um, and no problem. And he has the ear of the, of the president. Yeah, they call him Bush's brain, and that's a little too patronizing. I mean, sometimes it is hard to tell where one begins and the other leaves off politically. Um, the fact is that they're both very good at politics. Bush is interested in politics, and he's very good at the political side of politics. He has no interest in governance. Policy bores the living shit out of him. Um, it's a deficit in the city president, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> and so you're thinking, why would he run, uh, given that, you know, it bores him and um, he's, you know, just a trial to him. Happily, his political philosophy, based on Jesus, of course, um, is that um, there should be less government anyway. It doesn't matter if the government doesn't do anything, that's all to the good. In Texas, the belief is that the primary duty of government is to create the healthy business climate. And once you have the healthy business climate, business, business, business. business is spelled with a D in the middle, right. business. Um, once you have the healthy business climate, um, everything will take care of itself. You don't have to worry about anything else. In your book and in your, your columns, you've written extensively about this extraordinary network of, <clears throat> well, the only thing I can call it is <clears throat> big money, oil money, or all money, however you say that. Um, and he seems to be, if not in the middle of it, certainly uh, a player, a beneficiary, a bene yeah. going back to Midland, Texas, and all that. Can you situate him in the kind of Texas fiscal picture, financial picture? Um, yes. It's, uh, there is a great deal of money in the Bush family. Uh, both sides of it, uh, Barbara's side, perhaps is even richer than, than the Bushes. Um, but it is um, a tradition in that family that, that one young man go out somewhere and start over. And so Big George, Poppy George, went to Texas, which I think they all thought was quite extraordinary of him. They weren't sure that the Indians had been fully pacified. <laughs> um, and actually made a mint of money uh, in the oil patch. Um, and then his son, who clearly, you know, was a little confused and, and um, not quite sure what he wanted to do with his life, decided that he'd go into the oil business too. And um, he t had an oil company, which he took into bankruptcy, and so his daddy's friends came and rescued him. And so he got another oil company, he took that into bankruptcy, and his daddy's friends came and rescued him again. And he got another oil company, and he took that into bankruptcy, and his daddy's friends and so forth. Um, and this, the interesting thing about W um, is Jim Hightower's line, a born on third and thinks he hit a triple. Um, <laughs> never been clear to George why anybody couldn't go out there and fail in the oil business three times and then buy a baseball team. Um, and I think one of his problems is that he has resisted all his life recognizing the extent to which he was born uh, not with a silver spoon but a full set, uh, 12 dinner, 12 person set of cutlery. Um, and because he doesn't like to admit that, because obviously it's been a conflict for him all his life, relying on his daddy's name. I mean, he got into prep school on his daddy's name. He got into college on his daddy's name. I don't know why Harvard let him in. The University of Texas Law School turned him down. Um, he got into the Air National Guard on his daddy's name. And I would like to defend that particular unit of the Air National Guard, known as the Champagne Unit. Um, 
It is true that it was full of the signs of wealthy Texas families, including Governor Connolly's son and Senator Benson's son and then Congressman Bush's son, uh, but there were black members of that unit. They all happened to play football for the Dallas Cowboys. <laughs> then when we see his <clears throat> legislative proposals go to, up to Congress, including drilling in the natural, National Wildlife Reserve in, in the Arctic and Alaska and so on. The irresistible inference is that he is doing this, if not in behalf of, but certainly in aid of, big oil, big money. Now that's a cheap shot you can take against any president, but, but is, there, is, yeah. it, is there truth in that? No, with, with Bush, the interesting thing is that nobody, he, he does, you don't have to bribe him. Uh, you don't even have to persuade him. He really believes all that stuff. He's a true believer. Yeah, and you don't, I mean, it's wonderful because all these big campaign contributors, you know, um, would like him to do something that he we will do naturally anyway. He is the kind of uh, ideologue who, actually, I, I have to explain to you, West Texas is full of absolutely wonderful people, and he's a West Texan in an odd way. Midland is, what can I tell you about Midland? Oh, I know. Um, I was in an ACLU board meeting, that's American Civil Liberties Union, not a powerful organization in my state, um, <laughs> not long ago, and the representatives, the members of the board from Houston and Dallas had both described some really dreadful instances of gay bashing. So that evening I was seated next to the board member from Midland, and I said, well, have you been having any trouble with the gay bashing in Midland? And she looked at me and said, oh, hell, honey. There is not a gay in Midland who would come out of the closet for fear people would think they're a Democrat. <laughs> they're a conservative out there. <laughs> and W actually thought uh, that Jimmy Carter was leading the United States toward what he called European-style socialism. Now, if you remember the very Baptist Mr. Carter, uh, the unlikelihood of that being true, you had to live in Midland and spend a lot of time at the Petroleum Club to believe that. The contrast between George W. and George Herbert Walker Bush, father and son. Um, at one point I read that they didn't get along early on, but they have resolved their differences. Mm -hmm. Is he his father's son is he like I think he spent much of his life dealing with the fact that he's his father's son um, <coughs> and Poppy Bush was apparently a figure of, of great awe to all of them <coughs> I mean he may seem a little light and daffy uh, to many but he is, was a man of very many real accomplishments um, and you could see Bush's attempts to emulate his father um, and everything from trying to play baseball to uh, going into politics. Um, Poppy has more the, you know, upper class grace of never having questioned himself about anything. With Bush, you see that really intense competitive, you know, he's gonna, he's gonna beat you to prove that, that he's good. Um, they di I think they do, in fact, get along. They merely went through one of those sort of passages where you know, the late adolescent male. But whatever, daddy. whatever one says about President Bush the mm first, -hmm. he was the head of the CIA, <clears throat> he was an uh, emissary to China, he was ambassador at the UN, he knew the world. Right. Um, a trait that does not seem to have been passed on to his, to exactly. his son. Exactly. What I'm trying to explain to you is that there is an extraordinary degree of provincialism in Texas, and particularly in West Texas. Um, I think that provincialism is a universal characteristic. We're all provincials to some extent, but it is quite striking in Texas, and Bush is a very good example of it. In the same breath that people talk about the Texanization of the U.S., we talk about the Americanization of the world, the, this idea of empire. Does President Bush have in some recesses of his mind the idea of empire, hegemony, American. I very seriously doubt it. Um, then if we accuse him of that, if we right. say that America is trying to extend itself right. in uh, 
I won't use the word imperialistic, but it extend itself in the world, we'd be wrong then, would we, if we, if we ascribe that as a motive to the president? Uh, to the president specifically, yes, you would be wrong. On the other hand, he is surrounded by uh, advisors and people extremely close to him with a great uh, access to him, who I think do believe that. The whole neocon intellectual crowd at the Department of Defense, uh, Defense and then I think that, that Cheney-Rumsfeld axis. Um, that was uh, the, the sort of, you know, world domination theory was actually put forth by pretty much the same players during Poppy Bush's administration and was considered so lunatically extreme that nobody ever gave it a serious hearing. Uh, again, in 1997, many of these same players, called neocons, defense intellectuals, uh, issued a sort of general statement about the world, um, which basically is exactly what Bush wound up talking about some or a year ago, um, preemptive war, um, military hegemony, um, and I think much of it, again, this is a very dicey thing to discuss, um, but I think it needs to be addressed. Um, quite a few of the neocon defense intellectuals are Jewish. And in fact, several of them uh, have, been, have worked as paid advisors to the Likud party of Israel. Um, now, when you mention this, immediately, you know, you sort of get into, oh, please, not another Jewish conspiracy theory. It is not the protocols of the elders of Zion to point out that for many of uh, these American Jews, the desperate concern for Israel is clearly, clearly an influence in their thinking on foreign policy. But there has not been a question, has there, in, in the councils of Washington that <clears throat> American support for Israel is shrinking or um, would dissipate? Oh, I, I think that, um, I think there are, part, you know, part of the unspoken subtext of this foreign policy debate is, you know, the absolute lockstep commitment to Israel, no matter what. And of course, anyone like uh, one of the Democratic candidates, uh, Governor Dean, uh, who suggests that we might be better off with a more even-handed policy in the Middle East is, of course, immediately subjected to charges of anti-Semitism. Very dicey thing. After 9-11 and the infamous um, axis of evil, Again, written by a Canadian, actually, David Frum. Your contributions are... Incredible. I know, I know. Uh, the president set forth uh, a number of reasons for war against Iraq. Um, the weapons of mass destruction, the fact that he was a despot, the fact that he presented a, a clear and present danger to the security of the United States. Uh, the fact that uh, Iraq was a homeland for Al-Qaeda and, and perhaps there was a connection, in fact, inferentially he said there was a connection between Iraq and 9-11, uh, none of which has come to be true. Uh, the one reason for taking out Saddam Hussein that they specifically disavowed, they said this reason is not sufficient, there are so many others. Uh, is the only one they're left with, which is that Saddam Hussein was a miserable SOB. Right. <laughs> now, in the days leading up to the war and in the, in the days and weeks following the war, although arguably it's still going on, the president's approval ratings were atmospheric. They were right. extremely high. Right. Confronted with these new, dis well, these disclosures that the weapons, aren't, the bombs aren't there, Al Qaeda's not there, although they seem to be pouring in since the end of the war. Why is he so popular? Why does he retain the popularity he has? Well, his numbers are going down. Um, you know, he's below 50 percent, and um, a lot of people are desperately worried, including at the White House. Um, and I think the numbers were high for so long because we wanted to believe uh, and because we always rally behind the president in times of ma national emergency. 9-11 was certainly a shock to the system. Um, then we had a war in Afghanistan, then we had a war in Iraq. We were pretty much, there's an extent to which we were dragged kicking and screaming into that war. I mean, it took them a good six months uh, to sell that war to the American people. You remember the immortal words of Andrew Card, Bush's chief of, chief of staff, who said, when asked why they had waited until September to say we're going to 
we're going to have a war with these people. They had actually made up their minds months earlier. Uh, he said, oh, well, in marketing terms, you never bring out a new product in August. <laughs> and that's what they did. They marketed that war. And they marketed the shifting rationale uh, for it, the weapons of mass destruction, um, probably Al-Qaeda, the whole, you know, the nuclear program, all these scary things. Um, and even so, it was quite a struggle uh, to get the country ginned up enough to go. And then, of course, as often happens, once the troops were over there, we all swung around to uh, support them. And for a while there, it looked like uh, I, I, I am in the unhappy position of being able to say, I told you so, which is a terribly sour satisfaction. Um, it was a short, easy war. And all the people who said it was going to be long and hard and difficult were wrong. But even though um, his numbers may be falling, right. Uh, in a poll recently I read something like 56% of Americans believe there was a direct link oh, between Saddam Hussein and 9-11. 70%. 70%. It is such an indictment of the American media. There is absolutely no evidence that Saddam Hussein had anything to do with 9-11. And in, oddly enough, the Bush administration has never said that. Um, they have inferred it, however, on so many occasions and so many commentators in our public life had sort of carelessly made that connection over and over again that people are persuaded that it's true. Bushwhacked is not entirely about the president. It's also interesting that you talk about uh, the corporate economy, which is going sideways at the moment in the U.S. And you talk about, you talk to and about very ordinary people who can't make the rent, they can't get heat in their apartments in Chicago in the winter, and that their, their purchasing power, their salaries has diminished. There have been, I think, 700,000 jobs lost. 2.7 million. That's what I said, 2.7 million. <laughs> um, is he going to, is it possible that what happened to his father could happen to him? Victorious in war, Yet, on the domestic economy front, he went south. It would be the greatest of all ironies, because from the day they walked into the White House, both W and Karl Rove have been dedicated, and they're both shrewd politically, uh, to not letting happen to them what happened to Poppy Bush. And the lessons they overlearned uh, were never break a promise, no new tax, like no new taxes. Um, and they learned, they overlearned, in my opinion, uh, that you have to keep the base of the Republican Party, which is sort of the Christian right red meat Republicans, uh, you have to keep them happy. That's uh, the core support group. Right. And um, I think they've overdone it on both of them, and consequently, oddly enough, are in danger of repeating Poppy's mistakes precisely. Then why isn't it possible for the Democratic Party, uh, a fairly successful organization during the 20th century, to come up with an opposition that would speak to the concerns of the people you write about in, in Bushwhack, the people who, the 44 uh, million Americans who don't have uh, health care, uh, the, the falling down crappy schools, and all of that. Why can't the Democrats coalesce around somebody who could make those points. Consider the magnificent leadership potential of Tom Daschle. <laughs> Would you follow that man into battle or what? <laughs> um, I don't know why the Democrats are so gutless and spineless, but uh, I, it's certainly worth pointing out that they are. Uh, and every now and again, you know, you see them sort of one steps forth and says something and lightning doesn't strike and the others kind of go. Um, it's really interesting. Uh, Howard Dean uh, is, has really tapped into a deep well of anger. And that's, that's uh, the anger at Bush is there. It's very real. Um, it's not just over a rock. It's over what's happening in people's lives. Americans tend to be curiously passive about that, though. Very often, their lives are just turning to mud. Um, so polite, these Canadians. Um, 
And they don't make the connection between what's going on in their lives and political decisions. And we saw that in the book over and over. Um, it's maddening, uh, and at the same time, um, you have to admire people with that amount of gumption. I was listening in the middle of the night the other, the other day to George Norrie, is he the, all right. He's a talk show, national American. Uh, I'm so sorry. <clears throat> And they were talking about the $87 billion bill for right. Iraq. And the call, I heard three or four calls, and virtually everybody said it's worth the price to keep America safe. We have to spend the $87 billion, which could provide a hell of a lot of housing or health care. But the people who phone in late night talk shows say, we've got to pay the price to keep the country safe. Isn't that ironic? As though we had been attacked by Saddam Hussein. I mean, that, is, that was the amazing bait and switch that, that the Bush people pulled. Um, and Americans are genuinely convinced that we had to defend ourselves against that man who hadn't attacked us and didn't have any weapons that he could have done so with. Um, and the idea that the whole thing is a giant shock um, is just... I think Americans will probably do that wonderful thing human beings do when they're confronted with information they don't like, that you just sort of ignore it. All right, the information, you raised the question of information, and I, you have written rather scathingly on occasion about the media, yes. the profession, trade, or pastime that we're involved in, right. um, and you've been subject to some barbs because of that. I know that. Rush Limbaugh has taken terrible <laughs> shots at you. Breaks my heart. But <laughs> is, aside from yourself and three or four, well, more than three or four people I can name, there seems to be a somnolence in the, in the Washington press corps. Are, are, the, are we asleep here, or what, what's happening? It's, yeah, it's not so much somnolence, it's soggy self-importance. Um, I can't I, Washington, D.C. is the most dreadful place in the world to be a political reporter. It's a city where everybody says exactly what everybody else says. And what really drives me crazy is that when I go there, rather than sort of sweeping in and saying, God damn you fools, I am fresh in from the prairies of Texas and you people are full of mud, as they say in Canada. Um, <laughs> I'm not there more than 10 minutes before I find myself saying exactly what everybody else says. So I just, I stay away from the place. But I really, I was struck, I was there on book tour just a few days ago. Um, the absolute confidence with which these television pundits, uh, who must be right because they're on television, uh, say the silliest things. I mean, they are convinced that Dean is not, absolutely impossible, would be a disaster for the Democratic Party and has no chance of winning the nomination. Um, I think they better vote for Ken. Uh, and I don't, I'm not even a Dean person. Um, the things that they get excited about, it reminds me, they've gotten almost to an extent, it's like watching scorpions fight in a bottle. Um, those are, I guess a better example would be a gong show, uh, these little sort of world wrestling federation political chat shows um, where you put on some lunatic right winger saying totally absurd things. Uh, and then, of course, the left is held down by some peppy citizen like David Broder. <laughs> you know, it's, it's as though their idea of the balanced seesaw is you have somebody on this end and somebody in the middle. Um, and, and, of course, the political discussion is so canted toward the right that it's, it's just absurd. And the timidity, I mean, their inability to, to actually stand up and say, look, this emperor is not wearing any clothes. Then where, why did you come from where you come from? I know Texas has a as a streak of orneriness and, and populism and the Texas Observer and all those wonderful um, people who went cross grain, they went against the grain. What was it in your upbringing that you said, no, no, that it doesn't have any clothes and the ACLU is not a communist organization and 
Newspapers I, I, are asleep. I think it is true of almost all Southern liberals, certainly of, of my generation, that we started with civil rights. Anybody who was raised in the South before the civil rights movement and who was involved in that, um, I, I, that they, that's where Southern liberals come from, because for a long time that was the only political issue in the South. And one thing that having been there and done that uh, will do for you is that you never lose your sense of optimism, your sense of how much things can change and how fast things can change in America and how important the role of government can be in making it a place where there is liberty and justice for all, or at least more liberty and justice for all than there used to be. Do you find that, do you ever get discouraged? Uh, I mean, when you write about the Phil Grahams right. and the Tom DeLays right. and I think you wrote about Phil Graham, the retiring senator from Texas, that not even his friends like him. Um, <laughs> but don't you get discouraged or, or think, well, God, I, no one is listening, yeah. or if they're listening, they're not doing anything. Right. Um, again, that, that sense of, that permanent sense of optimism, uh, I think, comes from the experience of having watched the black people of the South rise up and take power for themselves. Um, and that was such an enduring lesson in democracy um, that I've never forgotten it. I know it can be done. Um, Texas liberals, of course, are in a particularly odd position. Uh, <clears throat> my late friend Billy Carr uh, was called a few years ago. Somebody called her and said, Billy, how are you doing? She said, well, they've just impeached my boy up in Washington. There's not a Democrat left in statewide office in Texas. Every judge in Harris County is a Republican. And yesterday I found out I have cancer. I think I'll go out and get a pregnancy test. With my luck, it'll come back positive. <laughs> and that's sort of the way Texas liberals are. We have no choice but to laugh. All right, we're moving into the quadrennial year, the presidential yeah. year. Yeah. The, the New Hampshire primaries are in. January, February. What do you see in terms of an effective opposition to the president and Republicans and a kind of opening up of debate, of people actually talking about substantive issues in the campaign? Well, there are, um, to take the second half of that first, there are a number of programs and projects and foundations and uh, what, what the uh, bien pensant, you know, the right thinking citizens of the nation. I keep, we keep trying to make the presidential campaign and debates better and with very little success so far, but we're still working on it. Um, and there are lots of interesting projects, including in-depth polling projects and um, you know, representative citizen groups where they get together and hash out the major issues and so on. There are lots of sort of interesting things like that going on, but I, I am cynical enough to think that it's not going to make a great deal of difference. Um, there are a couple of things, just as a political reporter, you have to think looking at next year's presidential election. Most people in our business um, are, for very good reason, um, look at money first. And Bush is going to raise over $200 million for his campaign. I could have sworn you said over $200 million. Yes, a sum that it dwarfs anything that has ever been seen before in American politics. In fact, it would probably go considerably higher than that. Consequently, many of my colleagues who have been around quite a few elections have already said, that sucker's over. Um, um, I, just as a general rule, um, anybody who would call a political race this far out is a nincompoop. Um, and you always, you know, it's, and I don't play that game. I'm not into predicting. I don't have a crystal ball. I don't know who's going to win the next presidential election. Anything can happen in politics and often does. Um, I see it quite differently. I, I think that there has been a genuine sea change in America just very recently. Uh, with people sort of waking up and seeing all kinds of things they don't like going but, on. But what happens the first time the Republicans run the Top Gun ad of the president on the USS Abraham Lincoln in his jumpsuit? I, I think the situation in Iraq, and I do not ever root for bad things to happen, uh, especially to my country, 
Um, I think it's possible the Democrats will be running that as an ad for their side next year. I really do. Um, I'm not sure, I mean, I stand back and look at it, I'm not sure what he's got to run on. Uh, I think Iraq is turning into a disaster. Uh, and I, again, my prediction was short, easy war, the peace from hell. Uh, and I think one should have seen that coming and, and should be held responsible for not having seen it coming. Um, the economy's a mess. Um, the healthcare system is not, is falling apart. And I mean, we're not just talking cracks here and there, we're talking huge chunks of it falling out. Uh, his environmental record is, is be, it doesn't have that much clout. It's not that much of an, an issue with many voters, but it is loathsome. Um, the corporate scandals continue. Um, there is no good news out there. I mean, what are they going to run on? Um, I, I wanted to go back earlier because I, I had failed to say something. When I was talking about provincialism, uh, in, in Texas particularly. It's very striking when you go through George W.'s foreign policy speeches. The words that appear over and over again are threat, danger, enemy, evil. Nowhere ever at any time has he spoken of how we might make a better world, how we might work with our neighbors and build institutions and solve problems together. And that is to my mind, the ultimate kind of provincialism, to see everywhere outside as a threat. They're different. They're not us. They're Canadian. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. It's good to talk to you. Now, some questions from our audience. Are you game for that? Sure. I like that. <clears throat> Molly Ivan. Hi, Molly. I'm Joe Green, Chairman of Democrats Abroad Canada, and a dual citizen. Um, I would like you to speak, if you could, to, uh, uh, within your knowledge, of the absentee ballot, the absentee vote in presidential politics, and uh, whether you think that's an important issue or not. There are about four, um, four to 500,000 Americans living right. in Canada, and uh, we expect that at least half of them are Democrats, maybe more. And um, we think it's important that that vote get out, and I'd like yeah. to hear your view of that. Well, um, there's a very real possibility if Bush wins the next election that the population of Americans in Canada will go up astronomically. <laughs> <laughs> um, you wouldn't believe the number of people who are talking about it seriously. Um, obviously, it is important, and. Um, I think it's going to be one of those elections when every vote counts. Um, I think we're looking at something close to a replay of 2000. Yes, sir. I'm concerned about what's happening with the United Nations and the attitude uh, toward the United Nations. First, they were uh, ostracized for not jumping in. Now, uh, people are saying in the media and others are saying that if they don't rush into support, they will prove their irrelevance. What is this business about the irrelevance of the United Nations, and how can it be combated? Well, you remember the first the threat was if you all didn't go along with us, you would be irrelevant, and uh, <coughs> you didn't, and now you won't help us, and so you're irrelevant. I, you may notice there's a theme here. Um, <laughs> I find that the pre-war, I really think that the pre-war diplomacy of the Bush administration was appalling. Um, I don't speak for anyone but myself, uh, but I thought among many other countries, the treatment of, our treatment of Canada, particularly the contemptuous dismiss, dismissal of, of what might have been the last possibility of actually getting a UN resolution, the Canadian plan, uh, was, there is a Texas word for this, tacky. <laughs> Rude and arrogant, tacky. And I was just embarrassed at the way we were treating the rest of the world, bullying countries into supporting us, bribing them, threatening. I just, it was conduct so unbecoming. Um, and the damage that was done to our reputation in the process was very serious and very grave, and it's going to take a long time to repair. We have the microphone, yes, sir. 
Uh, do you have any comments on the California recall n next week? Yeah. Oh. Those of us who live in Texas are so grateful to California. <laughs> which has been attracting a lot of attention this year. Um, I went out to cover the California election uh, to take a look at their situation a few weeks ago. Uh, the first thing I did was dye my hair punk purple to add to my credibility as a commentator on the matter. Um, Ray Davis makes Mr. Rogers look as though he were on steroids. Um, and. Arnold Schwarzenegger looks like a condom stuffed with walnuts. <laughs> now, I realize that this is not an in-depth analysis <laughs> of their policy stands. However, uh, given that race, it was the best I could do. Yes, sir. Uh, Ms. Ivins, I understand that uh, ABC will be doing a weekly television program now called The Gropers. <laughs> uh, I, uh, I, I would like to know if you consider George W. a dangerous man. Um, Do I consider W. a dangerous man? Yes. Uh, uh, I have a number of other questions, but we'll, yeah. we'll just deal with one, one, one at a time, not to worry. Right. Okay. Not to worry. Is he a dangerous man? Uh, to the extent that ignorance uh, combined with power is dangerous, yes, uh, he is. But I, again, I go back to that. He is not malign. Um, he, is, he is not mean and he's not stupid. Um, but he is terribly blinkered, uh, both by sort of Texas provincialism and class privilege. He, there's much of the world he does not see. I want to thank you. Okay. Thank you for being here. Thank, thank you for talking to us. Molly Ivins.